evening. Um, Good evening. <laughs> um, I was talking with Joe, and, and uh, first of all, um, I think we talk more than we talk to our wives right now, I think, but uh, thank you. Um, one who um, didn't want to give him with a presentation because I think you have questions. And so I'm here to answer questions. I can tell you timelines. I can tell you where we are, where we're headed, what we want to do. And if it's all right, I'll start with some details. And please ask me any question. I'm here to uh, serve you as well as our, not only our partners, but also constituents as well. So um, we, um, we've been able to open up in the summer with our offices, and thanks to risk management, they gave us strict guidelines that we could register. Uh, we have, what's interesting, with virtual education, we doubled the amount of students taking courses in the summer. We usually have about 8,000, this year we have 16,000 students taking courses. Board voted the other day to go virtual. Um, uh, as of Friday, um, it looks like in the state, 55% of all students will be virtual to start the school year. Our board did not put a timeline, as most districts have, such as Richmond placed the semester, Henrico and others uh, are going with uh, the first market period. Our board asked that we come back every, every board meeting to give an update on where the metrics are, has the, the Virginia Department of Education, excuse me, the Virginia Department of Health uh, put out their dashboard yet. That dashboard is going to be very important. I was on a call with them last Thursday with Fairfax and Virginia Beach, and they are hoping the governor will approve the dashboard in the next couple of weeks that will give us regional information. The problem is we get regional information, not down-centered information, so they're working on that as well. Uh, and so when you're looking at uh, how to move forward, uh, we do have a medical panel, uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the, just the, uh, Dr. Samuel and Mr. Johnson, uh, their staff members are going to be on this. They have, we actually have a meeting starting on Monday to talk about how do we answer our one question that we've proposed to everybody this week. How do we get back to normal 100% education in our school system? Um, Dave has actually offered to come around and show us in some of the areas where we can grow. Remember, everybody wants to talk about, well, we could have all of our kids, students come back. Um, that would be impossible when you think about six foot or three foot, even three foot barrier in some of our schools. Um, but it's also debating on how many students do come back. So we're going to ask risk management to come in. They've actually come in, will come in and look at our schools, say, here's the seating. We are actually going to show um, in multiple videos in the next, uh, every other day, the information is going out to our, 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 our parents and our students and constituents. <clears throat> but videos of what they look like. Uh, we will be doing a video on how to ride the bus with a mask, how to walk into the building with us, how to have a mask in the building, uh, and, the, and the guidelines that will happen. We're also doing videos to show what a virtual learning looks like. There is no doubt about that spring, we did not reach our expectations of teaching. But no one in the country can say that they did because we closed in one day and started virtual the next. Our expectations for our teachers and for our administrators, and you'll keep hearing me say this, we are acting as it's a normal day of school. We'll be putting out schedules tomorrow uh, to all of our parents on what a elementary, middle, and high school day looks like. Example, in a high school day, they run an odd and even day. They will run an odd and even day at the all secondary level. So you will have four classes. You will have your classwork, you will have homework, you will have grading, we will be taking attendance. Um, we will be calling students that are not in attendance that day. So the people in the buildings will be following those guidelines. Our goal is to get back to school, but to do it in a way that we feel is safe. And uh, I will tell you this, I'm not reading Facebook, I'm not dealing with all that stuff. I'm dealing with the staff, and what we believe is the best for our students. And we believe this. Um, I know that um, it would be very easy if someone from Richmond would just make some basic statements. But you can't tell everybody, well, everybody, all, all 132 districts, do your own thing and expect that to really work out well. Just to follow up with Scott and 
talking about sports. Uh, so uh, what will happen is it looks like they're going to vote, and the vote there will be no sports at all uh, in the December right now. Uh, and they're hoping, uh, one of the models, what we're hoping is that they look at two-month intervals in, the, in December, January, that would be um, the winter sports. And then they would come back with the fall sports and then end up with the spring that would go later. Um, besides that, everything else would be canceled. And, um, and so we are hoping that they do, they do not cancel, but they just push back. Um, we... Um, we realize the severity and things that we have to do. I will tell you that uh, our staffs are working 12 to 14 hours a day. Do I think the decision that was made on Friday uh, did not keep me up for a long period of time? I have not slept because I can, I'm concerned about our children. But uh, we are committed to doing what's right. I met with all of our principals again today, and they keep hearing the term, we are acting as it's normal and we're gonna teach as it's normal. Uh, we will be evaluating lessons. We will be uh, working with families um, to make sure that if they work during the day, they will be able to see the, the lessons that the children are involved with. And um, we, uh, like I said, the, the question we're, we're, we're trying to answer is how do we get back to normal? Uh, we'll, in April, August 11th, our, we'll have a report for the, that's uh, our next board meeting, we have a retreat. We'll discuss this again. If the, the guidelines are if the school board in August or September were to say we think we should come back to school this manner, it could be the hybrid model. It could say we think we can open up. We've asked for a three-week window to turn the switch, especially for transportation. Transportation is setting up um, to do their, their, their schedules as regular right now. Uh, we're looking at our students with disabilities. We're looking at our level two students. We're looking at our students and English language learners, how to get them back in the building sooner than later. Uh, all of this, as you well know, is extremely complicated, but we are working to do the best we can for our students and families. And we do realize um, that schools help push the economy. And so we know that as well. Uh, we are gonna be communicating a great deal with videos with information out. I do want to share with you that we are a pre-K to 12 Chromebook um, school system now. And uh, our, we are agreeing with Comcast that's paid through for private funding. We've raised over $300,000 of private funding. And anyone who does not have internet may go through the internet, uh, Comcast internet program. And that funding is paid for it out of the, through the community, through the, uh, Chesterfield Education Foundation. So the obstacles for parents are out of the way. They just have to say they want the internet. Where are the areas that they do not have Comcast, we'll be using our hotspots for those students as well. Our assurances were that 100% of our students would have Chromebooks and that they would have internet access. And we believe we have the funding to do that through private organizations and donations. So I know that you have questions. Um, I know uh, where the supervisors stand. I know the importance that you look at when you're thinking of 340,000 residents and, and things that we do affect you. But I'm here to tell you that our commitment is to get us back in school. Uh, it's just how do we do it? And we're working with a lot of your staff as well as state staff, medical staff, and we're, we're gonna get there. Um, I don't know when. And we will keep people updated in our regular communication Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Our schools are going to do the same thing. They're planning virtual tours and virtual meetings now. And um, I, I have no idea where we'll be in three weeks. Uh, but anything I haven't been blamed for right now is starting the pandemic, and I'm sure that will probably be by Friday. So, uh, but uh, I'll take any, Madam Chair, uh, anything I can answer, any questions, I'll be more than happy to do so. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight, um, and thank you for this opportunity. The one thing um, I'd like to ask, um, and then I'll turn over to my colleagues on the board, um, just for a little clarification. I think that what became clear to me, um, and I think the citizens, one of the heightened concerns they have, what became clear to us in the conversation the other night, um, is that you know, we're only now starting to hear conversation that you're actually opening the doors and saying risk management, come walk the walk with us. 
come look at a school uh, site, come look at a school room and tell us how we can equip this and, and adapt this and what and how does this work. And when we're hearing um, in particular from our side, again, you know, this is citizen services, this is citizen money. Um, from our side, from day one, you know, risk management, which is, as we all know, a shared department, has been walking the walk on our side um, to accommodate every opportunity for both our employees and for our citizens to have access to services. So it's a little concerning to me that that conversation and that come on risk management, come walk, come look at our school room, tell us what it will take. And I think that the heightened reason that brings concern to, to many of us and our citizens is that, that a decision was made without that having happened. So I don't know if there's an explanation that can be, um, or but but I'm I'm conveying what I think is what many many of us are hearing from a ground level fundamental starting point. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's an excellent question. We have reached out to risk management on a, multiple things. The issue of not asking um, probably was a, a discussion that happened over a month ago, where. We believe that 100%, 63,000 students coming back into our buildings were impossible. Um, the guidelines from CDC told us they were impossible. And talking with school districts of our size, they also believed that it was impossible. Mr. Johnson made a statement the other night that he said he thought we could. Um, I have a lot of respect for Mr. Johnson. That's the first time I've heard him say that. And I, then I asked him, would you be willing to help us look at that? Um, I do not believe we can, knowing our buildings, uh, but I will be open to have him give us his expertise. Thank you. Board members. Madam Mr. Chair. Mr. Winslow. Thank you. I have some specific questions about um, the process and sort of how we're here today a couple days following uh, the vote on Monday and I did watch the school board meeting in its entirety and I thank you for your service and I thank um, your staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for uh, Mr. Johnson, our risk manager in this county. So I, I need to ask you a couple of questions about how we got where we are. Um, and the first is, when were the options for return developed? I, I, I don't have a date for that. Um, it's okay, you can give me a ballpark, it's fine. The, the six options were looked at right after the Department of Education had issued a restart uh, to look at a variety of options, looking at 25%, looking at 50%, uh, uh, looking at virtual uh, in those manners. The, they also came with the guidelines for busing. If you remember, the guidelines for busing at one time were with nine students. Now they are uh, maybe every, uh, every seat with a mask. That would put 26 on a bus, which would be a little difficult since we bus 49,000 students. But we did, and we really pursued that issue as well. I did talk to Mr. Johnson about that. We talked about, we did talk about, back when we were putting this together, we had a conversation on the phone about busing and about other things. Uh, I know that uh, our maintenance, uh, Josh, our operations officer, has had conversations with district I mean, county staff as well about things that we have to do. I'm talking about the air filters and looking at things like that. We, we were in the process of saying, there has to be a way to open up the doors to get kids back in the building. We felt over the last several weeks that those opportunities would not be wise for health reasons. And I, I would just like to say this. We're, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be proven right or wrong. You know, and that's something that I have to live with. Uh, I know that Dr. Samuel showed that there is going to be a spike in September. That was his graph. That was his... He showed a chart, he called it a little blurry, but he said there will be a spike. And he doesn't know exactly what it's gonna be, but in his slide he said there will be a spike in September 
right as we're coming back to school. The one thing I did not want to do is open the school day up in one week and then close it the next week. And as we know right now, because we've been dealing with some COVID cases in our offices, that it's a, long, a considerable amount of time, it's more than two weeks to get, inf get information back on that. And then you're talking another two weeks to have two negative tests occur. So in that process there of talking about transportation, of looking at other things, all the obstacles that we have to deal with, um, that's, that's where they were developed and that's how we looked at them and that's how we present them. There weren't really, really many other options to look at than the ones we presented. Um, and we actually modified the one option four to option four B from input from our community. We held hundreds of meetings. Uh, our schools each had meetings with their parents and with their staff. We held nine town hall meetings. Uh, almost, you know, over 130,000 people. You may have been on more than one. I was. 13 and a half hours of enjoyment. <laughs> um, we've held, uh, we had our meeting with our Hispanic community, had 9,000 residents from the Hispanic community involved. Uh, only had one mistake, one sentence was done in Portuguese. She apologized. Uh, uh, but, um, and we have had over 10,000 questions that we put on our FAQ that we've categorized. So just so I understand, the, the six options came from the Virginia Department of Education. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And um, when those six options came down, uh, did you or anybody in the division invite risk management at that time to review those options and create a mitigation plan for each of those options? I, I will say we, we talked to the options with Mr. Johnson. When? He may know the time. I, I don't know. Uh, we, 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 we told him what the options were. We did not come with a mitigation plan for each one, sir. What, what options did you come up with a mitigation plan for so that the school board could review the mitigation plans and make it an uh, educated well, the guidelines, decision? The guidelines for us were almost fairly tight when you think about the busing guidelines, the seat guidelines that, that member until just recently, they went from six foot spacing to three foot spacing. However, there is controversy now about the three foot spacing, going back to six foot spacing with mask, and even the mask issue is changing from uh, should elementary students wear them, not wear them, how do they wear them, and those categories. So, you know, in hindsight, I probably could have had a meeting with Dave every day, Mr. Johnson every day. The guidelines that we were given from CDC and from uh, the Virginia Department of Health, even though it says, well, if you follow these guidelines, you can open up, the opportunity of how to do that right off the bat seemed to be impossible for us. And as you are aware, they keep, they keep moving the needle on us as well, whereas business, government, everyone else, they're pretty locked in. For us, they've been moving. And that's been the issue that the entire state, all the superintendents in the state and all the counties, school divisions have been discussing is that there's not, it would be nice if the Virginia Department of Health or the governor would come out and say, here it is. But there's a lot of flexibility and movement that's still occurring. And that's, that's our issue, and that's where we are. I mean, and, I, and I'm not trying to be uh, argumentative with you at all. Sir, you're asking me questions, and I appreciate it. And, and, and I, I would simply state that there, um, I think the, the crux of a lot of concern I've heard about uh, the, the decision made Monday uh, was um, that, you know, there was not a spelled out mitigation analysis for each option that was gone through, you know, uh, by either the board members or or staff so that uh, people could appropriately evaluate uh, those measures, for, you know, in terms of logistics and trying to understand how a school day would go yes, and sort of, you know, intuitively think about the, all of this. Mr. Wizzo, if I may. Please. Um, <clears throat> we, we did discuss the options, 
Uh, we just didn't put them in the in the formal pro, in the formal uh, in the in some of the things we have to do with each of these steps that come in, uh, and but we just didn't do that in the presentation. So on hindsight, and I appreciate that insight. When I come back again to say what we're doing, we will make sure those mitigations, everything will be in there. I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Mr. Engel. Thank you. I have several questions for you. Um, the parent survey seemed to be questioned. Uh, the results seem to have been brought into question by the members of the school board. Did you all learn something from that and come up with oh. a new way to do surveys <laughs> in the future? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we found in the course of when the survey went out, um, what we've learned, and it was the first time we used that process in the survey, that it was not centered just to our um, parents. It went out to everybody, to God and country. And it got, we found that it got put out on a Facebook site and people were answering that weren't even there. Uh, what, we've, what that team learned was any survey, and we're getting ready to do a survey with our parents again, it's going to be directed to the family. They will have to tell us who they are, their child's name, uh, because we truly want to know the students. Uh, if Ms. Ringel, if we send you, we know it's you. We know that your children, are they coming back to school in what grade? So the, the survey that went out was done in a new format. We scratched that format. And so any survey that we put out will have identification of who it is, and it will go directly to our parents. And if they, that way, when they, when they come back in, they will come back in with an identifier that we can um, for each school. So it's just thinking, because we did realize that of all the surveys, majority, a high majority of surveys came from five schools. And so we thought that was interesting because we've talked to families in other areas that that survey would have been different. Why they didn't fill it out, the timing was right at the end of school. I would have advised a different time to put that out. We have talked about the process of surveys now and to look at how uh, we identify the people doing the survey. And so we have learned quite a bit from that survey. Um, during that meeting, there was a $18 million number, and then I've seen numbers from 15 to $20 million that was estimated from somewhere to need to have added to your budget to be able to open schools. How come nobody on the Board of Supervisors had ever heard anything about any of those numbers prior to that meeting? The question to us was, what did we think the total cost would be to go back to school? We weren't asking for any money right yet because one of the things is we had to look at the total piece of this and things that we've spent money on already, things that CARES money would spend on. So what I've asked Robert Meister to do, our CFO, is to break down that information. Would it come, because we think the General Assembly's coming back, they're looking at other issues, like, you know, they got rid of counselors. They looked at other things. They're looking to maybe build that back in the budget. But we had to add counselors in there if we're coming back to school to make sure we had enough counselors in our building. We had to look at nurses, which we have talked to the county about. Um, and how do we look at this? Uh, not, you know, in a way that we can work this out because we don't have a nurse in every school. And so we're looking at the, the maintenance side the cleaning side, the running uh, multiple additional bus runs. We're looking at that, that overtime cost. When you're thinking about only allowing to transport 26 students at a time, they're looking at the extra cleaning that's occurring and that we have to do, we're doubling the cleaning ability that we have. Looking at also uh, the additional items that we need to buy for PPE, which when you think about uh, every classroom mask, every bus, Every day having masks for every child who gets on the bus, making sure we have wipes, making sure we have cleaning, that we cannot use our um, water fountains, so making sure we have enough water bottles every day. Not to, not to mean to interrupt you, but 
I'm not looking for the breakdown right now during the meeting, mm -hmm. but what I am asking for is can you get us that breakdown in writing with what those dollar Sir, amounts are? Sir, I will are promise so you, you will have that by Monday. Okay. Um, the, and we will, excuse me, we will break it down by what we think the costs are that the state should, you know, what they're going to be able to cover, where we are, and where we are right in the middle with the county. My concern with that, though, is that it almost sounded like during the school board meeting that because we didn't come up with some extra money for you to reopen, that was one of the reasons why you all had to make a decision to go virtual, and we hadn't even been, nobody on the board had had any of those issues discussed with us. So, Sir, I, sir, I can promise you that, that clear. that's never come out of my mouth. I've never said that. If, I've, if anything, I've talked, I've praised this board for how they've supported education. And if that came across, I hear in public to say, we're sorry that that came across that way. It was not intended to come across that way. And uh, like I said, I, 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 I talk, tell Joe all the time how happy I am that how we're working well together and we are trying to make the best of where we are. On the CARES money that you have already received, how have you allocated that? That CARES money was to look at as one of the cost factors that we had looking at adding additional counselors to the system, knowing that social and emotional learning was going to be an extremely important piece for us and that the counseling sessions, especially at the elementary level, were going to be needed. The high schools look in pretty good shape with counselors, but we were looking at the total picture, and we felt our youngest, our youngest individuals needed more assistance with social emotional learning. And so that's where the, we remember it was in our budget, and then it was cut by the state, and we felt we would go ahead and put that in there, uh, knowing that that funding was available for uh, till 22. On the county side, we have to use our money up before the end of this year. Is that the same for the schools? No, sir. We can we can carry it into twenty two. Okay, so we can so roll we can roll through this year and then and through next year. Are you gonna delay the implementation of that hiring process until after you reopen so that you don't spend that money? We will not spend that money until we reopen, sir. And uh, it was also said that you had enough money for one to one Chromebooks. Um do you currently have that money? In your budget, without more funding from the board, we have we have we have um, went into two different areas of funding: one from the state and one from the um, uh, from the county budget to uh, we to, to pick up the case for our kindergarten and first grade. The uh, discussion with the county was to which they could use the CARES funding for to give us the funding back to make sure that we have for reserves and for technology and for, uh, I'd say this, but reserve Chromebooks. Do you think that it's going to be effective for kindergartners and first graders to be able to attend class virtually on a Chromebook? Do I think it's a perfect scenario? No, sir. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. If, if I could quickly follow up um, uh, on one of the things Mr. Engel was addressing. So as we're looking at these additional fundings, I think one of the questions that this board is going to, and, and I'm not asking for a response today as much yes, as sir. just letting you know what we're going to be looking for. Um, as we've said and we've done in our budget and Mr. Zaramba addressed, we're going to be looking for what savings the school board has put and what measures the school board has put in place to save monies during this time that education has been um, basically um, reduced to a virtual level. Um, you're not using your buildings. You're not using many of your staffing. You've got 8,000 employees, um, many of which are not engaged in providing direct services to our students right now in a learning capacity and based upon the decision to be virtual will not be engaged in that. And I know that, you know, at first glance, um, you know, the numbers can be pretty staggering when we look at what your budget is, that the cost savings could be fairly substantial. And so I think that from speaking on, I think on behalf of all of us in discussions we've had, there is an expectation that um, from this board to our school board that there would be that um, expectation of, of savings of furloughed employees, of folks that mirror the fact that every penny we save um, is, is something that can be put towards those extra anticipated costs when every penny we spend is a citizen's penny. So um, just, just wanted to make sure that was, that was anticipated as we look for upcoming conversations in August. Other board members? Mr. M Madam Chair. Mr. 
Uh, oh, I'm okay. sorry. Certainly, certainly, Dr. Doherty. Thank you. Just uh, so you know, is uh, we are preparing information that we will be more happy to give you that shows uh, the staffing in the buildings, what the staff are doing, staff that are not being utilized for what we're doing. Example uh, that we have furloughed. We have not called anybody back from our furlough list at this point, and additional areas that we will save. And but we will definitely share with you school by school if asked. Uh, what our staffing looks like in the schools and what, and what everybody's doing in the schools. Mr. Carroll. So one of the things you said that you would utilize internet hotspots for underserved parts of the county. I live in an underserved part of the county. And I can tell you the internet hotspot is not going to work with a Chromebook at a speed level for a child to be able to have an interaction, an active video interaction with a teacher. And that's in, I live in Matoka, mm -hmm. right? And there are many parts of Matoka, if you get in, out into certain parts of Ettrick, although we did get them a new tower and eventually that may help them. But in the western part, uh, when you get out in Mosley, um, those hotspots are not going to work. And a lot of these people don't have Fios and they don't have Comcast. I just got Comcast last year. They didn't have it where I live. And so how are we going to provide services for kids that live in the country or in Matoga District um, when the technology is not there? Well, we've had our t technology people go out to the inter the air all four points of our area to test the hotspots uh, and to look at where we even have a map of actually where Comcast doesn't reach. I mean, we're happy to have Brian Jones send you that map. There are spots on our air where they do not reach. And so they've gone out with their hotspots and other items. Uh, in any area that they cannot, that will not work, um, then it's going to have to be the issue of the generator point hotspot that goes into an area that meets a community. Example, several smaller school districts, uh, I'll give you uh, Colonial Heights or um, Hopewell used a school bus uh, and place it in an area for a hotspot. Also, all of our schools and your libraries as well are hotspots for anyone in the area as well. So they've looked at the information, uh, and I'll be more than happy to have, have Mr. Brian Jones talk with you personally about it, but we have been looking around at that issue. Uh, we've issued over 300 hotspots for the summer, and uh, we keep checking to make sure they're operational. None of had a concern about it right now. We How have, many kids were using the hotspots? We, we, no, we have 300 students having hotspots right yeah. now. We I understand how bandwidth works. I'm sure you do, right? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, mm -hmm. but the more people who are utilizing the bandwidth, the slower it gets. Yes, it clogs sir, the right. pipe up, whether it's Comcast, Fios, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in cell phone usage, as an example, if more people are utilizing the towers and the service, it slows down data transfers, it might not interfere with a phone service, but it's certainly going to inter interfere with data transfer. And again, um, I, you know, we have a lot of parents who live out in these parts of the, the, the county, and not just in Matoka, but other parts that have rural areas as well, that are going to have to try and make this work for their kids. Uh, and, and if you're only testing it with 300 kids, what are you going to do when you have, how many kids you get, 60,000? Well, that's just with the hotspots. That's not with... But when 60,000 kids log on in different areas, and we'll say, I used to, I used to live in Deer Run. Mm -hmm. And when I had internet in Deer Run with, through Comcast, when people started using it, everything slowed down. If you're trying to watch a movie, it would, it would hang up, right? Because that's what happens when too many people are trying to log in to the same piece of technology. And so if we're going to rely on hotspots, we haven't tested it with these hotspots, with all these kids operating on Chromebooks and their teachers at the same time, have we? I can tell you that when you think of a regular school day and our Chromebooks are turned on. But during uh, the so school. They are, but you're still using the, the Using highway. the school you're, network. You're still using the highway as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we've... I know that Brian, and I don't know the exact numbers, and I can have, have him send them to you, of the expansion that we've had for the highway. Uh, even Right as we even started the pandemic in March, we started talking to the state and making sure that our, our, our Internet providers gave us additional bandwidth. I mean, 
I'll just say I hope it's fantastic because potentially in the future this could solve part of our capacity problem at the schools where kids could actually do remote learning and we perhaps relieve some of the capacity in the schools by doing that. You've that several times, by the way. I will continue to. Um, yes, sir. I was um, taken aback the other night at the meeting, and I know it's not your fault, uh, that um, I had to find out uh, in a public meeting uh, that there was uh, desires for additional monies from, the, from this board that no one contacted us about. I don't blame you for I, I don't know who to blame for that, to be honest with you, other than um, everybody has my telephone number. They can call me. Mr. Carroll, I've learned one thing as superintendent. Anything that goes wrong, it's the superintendent's fault. And I apologize that you were, you were taken off guard. Um, that uh, because not, of what it looks like. That was like. not the intent, and I will tell you that we've had, we've had conversations with some of the outstanding people that you have in the county. Um, that was not, but there was no intention of saying the, the county was not supporting us or in any fashion that that was meant to be. But I think also for the school board members to not know whether or not the, the money was available or not at the time. I mean, one of them said, I just found out that the money was available. Just found out. So for them not to know ahead of time, because I got to tell you, if you came to me or us and asked us for $21 million tomorrow, that said, we can get kids in schools tomorrow, but I need $21 million. We would have found it to do it. We would have found it. Uh, and um, we'll still find money if we have to to get the kids in schools because that's what the parents want. And for the kids that don't want to come to school or the teachers that don't want to come to school that want to work virtually, fine. Uh, but we need to find solutions to this, and I look forward to the solutions that you all going to bring forward. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, let me just briefly follow up. First of all, I want to thank you for being here, Dr. Dodger. Yes, sir. Um, I, I don't uh, envy the decision you, the board and you have had to make. It has been incredibly difficult, no doubt about it. So my sympathy is for that. But, but in the midst of the challenges we face, as a person of faith, I know that out of difficulties can come great success. Uh, God has a way of turning around even the worst situation and bringing out victory. Uh, he's always done that. Genesis 22, 8, with Joseph, who was a, in jail, didn't end up being the prime minister of Egypt, most powerful nation on the earth. So, so God can do all things. And I hope that we'll be open and be open to opportunities that we can utilize in the midst of this tragedy, this evil virus, to come to, I think, even better place. We have to have faith, we have to have vision, we have to be open to do it. Uh, so uh, my, my hat's off to you, sir, and all you're trying to do for six or 3,000 students. I want to go back to the question on the survey. I want to follow up with the survey. Uh, you mentioned five schools, which is not representative of 63 schools approximately, is my question. In terms of the responding survey participants, uh, you mentioned, were there none Chesterfield possibly responders? Do you know that, or can we ascertain that? We can just by the response back through email, uh, and that's what we found out. And uh, we, we found it out originally because we were informed that it was taken off the site and put on a, on a Facebook uh, okay. for people to use. That's why we've changed our entire format okay. of surveying for more secure services. Yeah, I, I applaud you because in the past we've learned many years ago that uh, people will respond and, and try to comment on what's going on in Chesterfield and don't even know Chesterfield. And so when you have a lack of knowledge, the yes, responders, sir. you can have those kinds of situations. And I always look for district-specific information. I always look to which district. I'm always focused on Dale first, uh, the Dale district respondees. And then I look at others, but Dale first in this regard. Uh, Dale Schools as well, so I, I applaud you. So for you're it. supporting Dale School District, I take it. Yes, I'm supporting my Dale yes, District sir. School Board member. I'm supporting you too. Yes, sir. You I know, know. I, I don't know the best decision, uh, but the governor, I understand, has deferred to the school boards to make those decisions. What the governor has stated, who's the chief executive of the state, and so I, I deferred to my governor in that regard, who's done a tremendous job during this pandemic, 
Uh, and one thing I also might add with regard to representation and information is that I hope that we'll look at other opportunities for learning in the evenings, for tutoring, or even if Saturday is required uh, and meeting rooms in our libraries and in other facilities throughout the, uh, the region. For example, we may have some students who might want to use the convention center, which has so much space that you can definitely get lost walking through it even. So I think there are many options. And we, yes, as a member of the Richmond Region Tourism Board, the regional elected leaders discussed that issue just a few weeks ago about letting that space be available for hopefully Richmond City students who are closest, but then also Chesterfield and Henrico as well, because we're regional. Yes, and at the end of the day, it's really about making sure that we do the very best we can to educate each and every child. And we realize that different schools have different challenges uh, in terms of their socioeconomic, and we want to be cognizant of that because we want to be about equity. I think that word is a part of the platform that you've been working on for several years now, equity in our schools and equity with regard to our students. And so I, I applaud you, and I, I thank you again for being here for the hard work you're doing. And so uh, at the end of the day, it's about these people we serve, the students, the parents, those that we serve, those are our boss, those are our taxpayers, and they, they, they certainly have a say in it. So thank you again. Ms. Holland, thank you. Madam Chair, I'd just like to... Just one yes. final statement, uh, Dr. Darty, and that is that uh, I'm obviously, just like everybody else on this board, I'm surprised that the server is still working. There's so many emails that continue to come in from parents across the county. Um, and one of the things that they're highlighting is increased costs associated with uh, daycare, tutoring, alternative schooling options that are being uh, looked into. And, um, and so um, I would just ask and echo um, my colleague, Mr. Holland's request that the school system uh, work with us as much as possible to uh, meet the needs of our community during this time, given the decision on Monday uh, in as many ways as it can, uh, being collaborative and cooperative as I know it can be. Um, extremely important right now that we all work together. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Madam Chair, one last thing. So. One last thing. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming tonight. I mean, I know you knew you were going to be in the hot seat, right? Uh, and I hope, <laughs> well, uh, you I know, understand. I mean, no disrespect. I, uh, I think we've all been getting um, hundreds upon hundreds, maybe thousands of emails from, from parents who want answers to questions uh, because they, they're really concerned about the education for their children. And I know you are too. And I know that there's a lot of teachers out there that actually want to be back in the classroom. And I know there are some that don't, which I think we can accommodate both if necessary. Uh, in the future, um, we do want to work with the school board and work with the, the with y'all to make this work for our people. Um, that's why we all signed up to serve, right? Yes, sir. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, so just a couple of um, issues as we wrap up. W one of the things that um, that I'm going to ask that we're also hearing from our um, parents that is of concern to them is what work is being done with our teachers to get them better prepared to do this virtual learning. And one of the things that came to my attention and was stated the other night by actually some of your teachers that came before the school board was that they were actually speaking contrary to what had been put out about the fact that staff had been receiving training for these last three months. And I'm not necessarily asking you to in any way justify, but I'm stating to you that I think that it would be very, very helpful to parents if there was better information and better sharing regarding of that. I think that what happened, as we all know, is that this community all, this country, this world turned upside down on a tailspin. And so everybody came together because that's what we do in Chesterfield, to be collaborative, to be forgiving, to be accommodating, to figure out how we do this. And I'm very concerned, we're all very concerned about the discord that now exists because of the decisions that not everyone comes to an agreement with. But that doesn't have to stay in discord. We're here to say we want to help mend that field and bring everybody back together. And, and transportation is a prime example of 
where in, there are pockets in this community where parents will easily say, don't worry about it, we'll get our kids wherever they need to be. You, you focus the transportation where it's most needed. And those are conversations that I think we need to be mindful and have. The last thing I'm gonna ask you, and, I, and I'm hoping that you're in agreement with this because I'm alerting you that I'm asking our internal audit department to get involved in an audit on an issue that was very troubling to me that came to my attention during these conversations um, and during what was presented to your board the other night. And that was the fact that we had teachers bring it to our attention and your attention that there was bullying going on, that there was harassment going on by members of your department and the CEA. Um, now we know that the CEA is, has a president or a chair, but there are also members of that CEA board that are members and employees of CCPS. And that's very troubling, and it's also something that I know CCPS and the county do not tolerate, and we, I know from reading all of your standards of conduct, you don't tolerate from students. And so I think we owe it to our entire population, our citizens and our teachers, with a shared department of internal audit to create and conduct an audit of that to ensure that every one of our employees on both sides always has the opportunity to have a free voice on whatever the issue is and feel that they're supported in an environment. Madam Chair, I support you 100% in that issue and uh, I would be appalled if any of my staff did that. Um, I think people know me and uh, try and to I know example. You, and I knew you would and support. I, if we have to sign a letter of agreement, I will, or MOU, because there is no way that should ever happen. Well, and I agree. And I'm hoping that this audit shows that there is no evidence of that, but I think we owe it to the employees that had the strength to bring it up. And I know there were some the other night that said there was evidence of that, and it, I found it very troubling and against the code that all of us on both sides and all of our citizens, all of our um, employees are entitled to in a safe environment. And so thank you. I, I felt certain that you would join us in that. Yes, and so um, thank you. I'm chair, one, one other thing. Um, Mr. Holland brought up a good point. Our classrooms are not the only place where education can take place. Yes, sir. We need to think outside the box and reach out to our business community, reach out to our community across the vast Chester County that we have and look for other locations that we can have classes held that could be socially distanced, that could help us meet the mission even when we go back. I am sure that there are places in our community, clubhouses within our communities, clubhouses at some of the country clubs, vacant uh, warehouses that we may have there are places that I am sure our business community would avail to the school if they could get their kids back in school. And so let's think outside the box on that. And Jim, thank you for reminding me of that. Matt, can I yes, Mr. Engel. Um, to your point on um, not necessarily bullying, but an example that some of the teachers have given to me that um, has caused them some concern is the CEA will put stickers on up for the people that are members in the schools to signify that they're a member. And that may seem benign, but by allowing that, the other teachers feel like they're being bullied or being called out because they okay. see these stickers up there and other people say, well, how come they don't have a sticker? So I just wanted to point that out to you that I have had teachers uh, express that to me, and that's an, a specific example of what we're talking about. Just, and I thank you for that. Just so you know that I don't control CEA. Uh, there's a lot that I'm responsible for, uh, but I think the audit is extremely important to if that did occur or things happen, that we bring it to bear and, but, and rectify that immediately, by the way. But, but do you control, control what school. goes in the schools? I though, do right? that, and we will look at that issue for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming and spending all of this time with us. Um, thank you for the relationship and the, and the conversation and um, hoping and knowing that whatever it is that we can do to provide support 
knowing that this decision is fluid, that it is constantly being reviewed, knowing that we've got staff, shared staff and our staff on our side, ready and willing to step up, assist however we can. Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors, thank you very much. And I look for a continued growing partnership. Thank you so much.